touch responsive keyboard instrument. The fat pianoforte as the amateur instrument par excellence. Uh, already in Germany during the 1650s. And the clavichord's success as the delicate private contemplative boudoir instrument uh, was being assured. Uh, in any case, it was the keyboard uh, rather than the lute, which henceforth we would expect to hear a lady playing and singing to. We're reading from the untuning of the sky. We're going to talk about how the pianoforte untuned the music of the spheres and took over from the lute. That's terrible to think. You think it's due to the piano that we lost touch with the music? Robert Seeley's The Lying Lover, first produced in end of 1703, contains a song that although perhaps not the first of its kind in English, is certainly representative of a fashion to come. The spinet, to silly a spinet. I think a spinet's a keyboard. Thou soft machine that doest her hand obey, tell her my grief and thy harmonious lay. To shun my morn, moan is thee shall fly. To thee shall fly, to her touch be sure reply, and if she removes it, die. Know thy bliss with the rupture shake, uh, tremble over all thy numerous make. Uh, speak in melting sounds my tears, speak my joys, my hopes, my fears. Thus force her when from me she'd fly, by her own hand like me to die. <laughs> Did you see anything about the, the piano in there? <laughs> We're reading from Richard Seeley's The Lying Lover about the keyboard. Hence the keyboard is no Orphean or even Apollonian attribute, but merely an instrument. Hmm. Wow, Orpheus didn't play piano. An engine for the expression of feelings of the most rarefied kind. My joys, my hopes, my fears. It is the mere fact of Celio's touch itself. Not a transcendent skill, her armorous art of fingering, that associates the lover with the instrument to her touch to be sure, be sure to reply, and if she removes it, die. This is merely a love song, wherein the music making has all the signs of being a homely occupation like fancy work. Hmm. We are reading from Arthur Lasser's Men, Women, and Pianos. <laughs> mm -hmm. Seems the women took all the pianos because it was fashionable. For the ladies, it's like fancy work. <laughs> is it feminine to play the piano? Fancy work, a female accomplish, accomplishment. Uh, hmm. No, it's not that. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. It was a baby called a mark. Do you know that there were men who, that like, um, the, the jazz musicians, they, they studied piano secretly because it's uh, only for women and down in New Orleans, you're supposed to play. If you're a man, you play like trombone or saxophone uh -huh. to play the pianos just for women uh -huh. we a female accomplishment uh, if you are an accomplished female you play the piano uh -huh. you play the harpsichord or the clavichord or the spinet the poem in romanticizing the relationship between the beloved and her occupation has more affinities affinities, perhaps with such Elizabethan sonnets as Shakespeare, number 128. Quote, How oft when thou my music music placed uh, than with the epigrammic convention of the intervening century 
about that convention, it should be remarked in conclusion that the form of the complimentary epigram in praise of a lady singing did not always entail the cosmological figure. On the other hand, it is the exceptional poem indeed that manages to avoid it, even though it turned a wit on some other bit of musical lore, and in a rare case through the highly indiv individual style, and particular use of obstruction. To illustrate the case of these first of these cases, we must cite in passing a song, Cecilia singing of Ka Karu Karu Karu, where it is the old theme that treats uh, of how in Yeats' words love comes in at the eye does love come in at the eye i guess then you fall in love at first sight with a woman does that mean love comes in at the eye hmm. did you fall in love with me at first sight at setsang <laughs> or did i fall in love with you The parallel in Yeats' poem is that of wine entering at the mouth. Uh, wine entering at the mouth. Here it is that of music entering at the ear. Now we have love enters at the eye, music entering at the ear. We're now reading from Ka. I can't pronounce this. C A R E W. Ru Karu. Huh. How do you pronounce his name? You that think love can convey no other way but through the eyes into the heart. His fatal dart close up those casements. And But here, this siren sing, and on the wing of her sweet voice I shall appear. The love can enter at the ear, but and avail your eyes. Behold the curious mold. Where that voice dwells, and as we know, where the cocks crow, we freely may gaze on the day. So may you, when the music's done, awake and see the rising sun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Let me try that again. He's saying that Yeats is saying that love comes in at the eye. And this guy is saying, music enters at the ear. You that think love can convey no other way. But through the eyes, into the heart, his fatal dart, close up thy casements and but hear. This siren song, and on the wing of her sweet voice, it shall appear that love can enter at the ear. Do you think love can enter at the ear? Actually, you can like a voice. When and you meditate, then you hear the sound. Probably. You can hear... You can also like a sound and fall in love with the sound of someone's voice. <laughs> then unavail your eyes. Behold the curious mold when that voice dwells. And as we know, when the cocks crow, we freely may gaze on the day, so may you, when the music's done, awake and see the rising sun. Uh -huh. Wow. So not only can you listen to the music of the spheres, you can see the rising sun. Huh. I don't know. There's a lot of interesting poets, including this one. I like Lovelace, and I think Estrati is good. Similarly, Drummond of Hawthorne Den plays upon the blindness of the mole and the proverbial deafness of the asp in his 24th of a set of madrigals. Um, to Darmantia singing, reading Drummond. Uh, It is not too late, it is not too much, thou wait didst to me prove a basilisk of love, and didst my wits bewitch, unless to cause more harm, 
Maid serene to thou with a voice of me charma. Ah, through thou so my reason didst control, That to thy looks I could not prove a mole. Yet to me not that wrong, As not to let me turn asp to thy song. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, as if the conventional allusion to the sirens occurs here, it, it is in order to be balanced to by the figure of the basilica. It is also almost the point of the poem that Ma Tha Maintia is possessed of the magic of both eye and ear, while the compliment merely proceeds to organize the parallel charms in a fairly obvious way. But the fact remains that in both of these poems, an, an almost metaphysical epigram has been turned without the assistance of the image of heavenly harmony. When, on the other hand, a poem's texture of image and concrete illusion is sufficiently rarefied, an enconium of singing can make it leap into a scribe perfection without benefit of the rungs of wit and traditional reference to Platonism. Platonism of Herbert of Cherbury seeks in to a lady who did sing excellently, more to give an account of the power of the lady's voice to charm in the most abstract terms and to present its bearer with an, any customary garlands. For its very beginning, it employs a wit primarily to bend some metaphysical commonplaces to a particular use. Quote, poem, quote. <sighs> When are rude and unfashioned words that long a being in their elements enjoyed, senseless and void, come at last to be formed by thy tongue, and from thy breath receive that life and place and perfect grace, but that now thy power diffused through all their parts are able to remove all the obstructions of the hardest hearts and teach the most unwilling how to love. <laughs> When they again, exalted by thy voice, tuned by thy soul, dismissed into the air, to us repair a living, moving, and harmonious noise, able to give the love they do create a second state, and charm not only all their gifts, griefs away, and their defects restore, but make him perfect, who the poets say, made all was ever yet made theretofore. When again all these rare perfections meet, composed in the circle of thy face, as in that place, so to make up of all one perfect sweet, who is not then so ravished with delight, even as the, of thy sight, that he can assure his sense is true, or that he or live, or that he do enjoy himself or you, or only the delights which you did give. Hmm. Hmm. Tradition, doc, traditional doctrines of the soul as tuning. Hmm. We're talking about the traditional doctrines of the soul as tuning or scale of the rational character of linguistic sounds seem as depending on presence of soul to give forth both of these are to be found in aristotle as we have seen are here marshaled to support a tedious argument but it is almost in the tediousness as well as the kind of paradox entailed by the final question that this poem seems complementary to all at all it is it is cer certainly closer to don than to caro in the sense that it employs an abstract intellectual conceit uh, we have to stop there mm -hmm. We uh, were talking about, we started about the piano. 